My father that day decided what to do was, if I failed and I'm worthless to my family, I must leave. And he did. And to me, it was the worst day of my life. I'll never forget it. I loved him more than anything. I had four fathers. He's the one I finally got attached to. It's like, mom, I'm confused. But then finally, years later, I got the benefit of it because out of all those experiences and all that pain, that day I made three different decisions. First decision is I just decided to focus on something different than him. And that's the power we have. We get to decide what to focus on. And my decision number one is, I want to focus on the fact there's food. What a concept. Pretty cool. But the most powerful thing to change my life was meaning. I said, what does this mean? Because my father had always said, my mother had always said, nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares. Don't care about anybody, they don't care about you. And that day I had physical evidence. Those you bringing food, I want you to know that's not just food. That's called love for someone. That's called hope for someone. That's called surprise for someone. And that day for me, I went, strangers care. And so I started caring about strangers. And I decided someday I'm gonna do the same. So when I was 17, I fed two families. It was like one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I went to the grocery store, I was all excited, saved up all my money. Went to the manager and said, I want to feed two families. This is what I'm doing. It's not for me. Give me a discount. And he gave me 10%. I thought, cheap bastard. But I went out and I delivered this food. And ironically, um, I called this church. And I asked in the barrio, a particular place, where are some families in need? They gave me two names. I put on t-shirt, jeans. I wasn't going to be acknowledged. I also didn't want somebody to be insulted because I saw what happened to my father. And I wrote a note, said, this is a note from a friend. And I said, I just want you to know, we know you're having difficult times. Everyone does at times. And I want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving. And please feel loved, take care of your family. And someday, if you can, do well enough to do this for one other family and pass it on. But love a friend. And I had it written in Spanish as well. And I'll never forget, first place I pull up, this rotten old van, stick shift van, that I borrowed from a buddy of mine all these bags of food and I went into this place and got out pulled up this little tiny building really tiny knocked on the door and when I knocked on the door this little woman opened the door it's probably half my size she's not hard I'm six seven so she's like five two and she looked up at me like this and she saw the groceries and she screamed and she started grab my head and pull it down to kiss me and I was like no 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 delivery boy delivery boy and she goes, no, God gift, God gift, God gift. And she didn't speak English, so I handed her the note. She read the note, she crying again, started trying to kiss me again. I said, no, no. And she goes, God gift, God gift. So I pointed, where do I put this? In this tiny little room. There's a table there. I put the food down. And I went over to get some more groceries. And when I did, four children come running out. And one hits my leg and wouldn't let go. And when they saw the pumpkin pie, it was over. <laughs> and... It was one of the most emotional experiences of my life because first of all, this little boy just wouldn't let go. And I delivered this food and this woman was crying and smiling. And I stayed there just to take it in for a few minutes, seeing them all. It was like going back in time. And then as I went to go leave, I couldn't speak Spanish. And she was like trying to say something in Spanish. And I didn't know what to say. And it was Thanksgiving. So I said, Elise Navidad. <laughs> She's like, I heard the song, okay? <laughs> and she laughed and laughed. She's crying and laughing. One of the more beautiful experiences of life, isn't it? When you have both those experiences in your body simultaneously. And I remember I got in the van and all the three, four kids were sitting on the, on the bench here. And she's standing there waving and I pulled in going reverse. And I looked in the mirror and as I looked in the mirror, I saw these kids there and I saw mom crying and smiling still. And then I lost it. I started crying uncontrollably. And I'm like put, trying to put the thing in gear the tears come through my eyes and I thought to myself, what? I mean, this is a beautiful thing. Why am I crying? And then I realized what a gift that day was. I realized that my worst day of my life was my best day. And my goal for you, if you don't already have it, my guess is you've already done it, knowing where you are in your world today. But maybe your second worst day, it's time to make a best day. Because out of every tragedy, out of every pain, it only gets healed when we find a deeper meaning. When we find there's a higher purpose in it. 
And I realized that I wouldn't have been there that day. I wouldn't have that hunger to help somebody else if I hadn't had the hunger in my own soul at one point missing. So it's very personal to me. I want to thank all of you that made the contributions. And I told Mark and I've announced that I'm going to match the million meals if you hit it. And I'm sure as hell expecting that you will. And so we'll get two million. And when I told that, then Mark said, I'll match that. <laughs> So in the mid-1980s, a theologian named James Carsey wrote this little book called Finite and Infinite Games, in which he defines these two kinds of games. Uh, finite games, which have known players, fixed rules, and agreed upon objectives. Football, right? There's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and the, object the objective is to win the game. Um, and then there's infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players. You don't necessarily know who all the other players are. Um, the rules are changeable. You can play however you want. Um, and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Um, what I find so fascinating about this idea when I first learned about it is we are players in multiple infinite games every day of our lives. There's just no such thing as being the winner in your marriage, you know. Um, um, there's no such thing as winning global politics, and there's definitely no such thing as winning business. Um, business is an infinite game. Um, and yet, when we listen to the language of too many leaders, they talk about being number one, being the best, and beating their competition. Based on what? There's no agreed upon objectives, there's no agreed upon time frames. And so what ends up happening is you have people building organizations and leading with a finite mindset, playing to win in a game where there's no such thing as winning. And when we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game, there's a few very predictable and consistent outcomes, amongst which include the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, uh, the decline of innovation, all of which contribute to the eventual demise of the organization itself. Um, and so what I wrote about is, is, is what it means to lead with an infinite mindset. Because we teach leadership as if it were a finite game. Um, and, you know, people start business with the goal of winning, being number one, and, and that's a problem um, because that's impossible. Um, so what I wrote about in a game is, is leading with an infinite mindset. I want to start, so the book is great, by the way, and I really enjoyed it. It's a wonderful pick and mix, as they call it in the UK, of different topics where you're diving in, sometimes very quickly, and then other times a much more prolonged. Yeah, depending but, on the on the subject, and mm. or, <laughs> or depending on how much I knew about, <laughs> the, <laughs> about the subject brought to me that I could then comment on. Equally yeah. fair. Yeah. One of the ones that really hit me was you talking about your dad. You called it a eulogy of sorts. And oh. you went through some of the things that he did, which I actually, I didn't know anything about your dad before reading that. Mm -hmm. What was it about your dad that impacted you so much that you still carry today? So it's not so much, oh, he's my dad. I love my dad. That's all true. But at the end of the day, what matters is for who and what you become in life. For me, at least, was... Uh, what level of wisdom did he glean in his life and then successfully communicate to me, either by example or by just explicit statement? And that combination of those two means of delivery had some important uh, impacts. Impact. See what I did there? <laughs> impacts on my life. Uh, just for example, and I give these examples in that that, that eulogy was a letter to him during the memorial service. He died a couple of years ago at age 89, so it was not, not a tragic death. But you still miss someone even though you know they're ready to check out. And uh, I'll just give one example, if I may. In high school, he was in gym class and they were lining up and they were about to enter the next athletic unit and it was track and field. And the gym instructor pointed to my father online and said, Cyril Tyson, everyone look at him. He does not have the body type that would excel in track. And they used him as an example. And he says, what? No one is going to tell me what I can't do in my life. And he used that as the reason to start running. 
and he started track in that moment. I mean, not that exact moment, but <laughs> he decided that his one of his next tasks in life would be to take up running and excel at it. Within a few years of that, he became world class. At one time, had the fifth fastest time in the world. In the middle distance, they don't run this anymore, 600 yard run. And uh, he, in 1948, the Olympics was not yet ready to come back to us because we're still reeling, roiling from the Second World War. Instead, there was still an Olympics. It was called the GI Olympics, and it was held in Hitler's stadium. Whoa. So he competed in Hitler's stadium uh, in the late 1940s, and just one of the great memories of his life. But the reason I'm saying all of that is, there's a friend of his named Johnny Johnson, who they were competing against the New York Athletic Club. In the day, it mattered that you had amateur status. No one's thinking of that anymore, but back then you couldn't compete in the Olympics if you were professional at all and there's a whole so professional was deemed sort of you were tainted in some way and it's hard to think that that used to be how people thought but that's how it was uh, in the day once you graduated college you needed some sanctioning body to compete with so there were athletic clubs the New York Athletic Club at the time accepted only white Protestants so there was another club called the Pioneer Club, which took everybody who was not accepted to the New York Athletic Club, which was basically blacks and Jews, is really what that came down to, and some Catholics, but basically blacks and Jews. So he competed alongside Jewish athletes. So there they are competing against the New York Athletic Club, and his best friend, Johnny Johnson, okay, was coming around the back stretch might have been the quarter mile, coming on the final straightaway. And a runner from the New York Athletic Club is a few paces behind him. And Johnny Johnson overhears that runner's coach say, catch that nigger. And he overheard this. So what did he say to himself? He said, this is one nigger he ain't gonna catch. <laughs> and that extended his 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 lead to the finish line and he tells the story not with any bitter tone as you might think any story like that today would certainly be um, told with with great remorse and consternation so he never had that kind of tone when he shared those stories with us it was here's an occasion to parlay what today might be called a microaggression into a reason to excel even more than you had expected of your own abilities and talents. And so I have taken that lesson with me. He was just telling a story. He didn't say, let me give my kids a lesson today. No, these are just things that happened in his life. And uh, in my sort of letter to him in death, I recount for the audience several of these examples and that among them. If some of y'all, you got some homeboys you connected with, but you know they ain't really living how you supposed to be living and they leading you down the wrong way, you know from Brian's story, yo, if I remove myself from it, if I plug in with positive people, I can make it. Why would you waste one second doing something that wasn't progressing your dream? Go after this thing called life. And don't look back and have regrets. Understand that you're in a place and a position right now when hard work and valuing people, nothing. I promise you. I promise you that everything is not going to go the way you wanted it to on every single play. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. Anything that comes fast and easy leaves you the same way. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with time this tough? What are you willing to sacrifice for greatness? 
Your future self is counting on your current self to never take shortcuts and never lack integrity. Because a day will come for you to walk with character and have clarity. Greatness is your destiny. But at times you must reboot your mental computer. Because every step you take today will directly affect your future. And so when I live from the moment, what I'm doing is I'm celebrating it, I'm acknowledging it, and I'm able to be present in it. And so what stops me from, from that is the guilt of the past and the anxiety of the past and the resistance of, of what you know I've been through, afraid of going through it again. Some become a victim to life. Things happen, pain heartache and loss, we can either be the victim or the victor to these situations. They say win or lose, at least you took part, but this is life. I am not here to take part. I am here to win one life. You'll never be able to fix what's behind you. You have to run after what's in front of you. What's the first thing they say when you get on an airplane before they take off? Fasten your seatbelt. Why? Because you will experience some turbulence before you reach a comfortable altitude. The only way to get unstuck is that you need something stronger, something greater, pulling the thing that is stuck. Because there's some people today that you're single and you feel like you're stuck. You feel like you're at a halt. You don't feel like you can progress in life. You don't have to be popular to be powerful. I ended up going to dinner with, becoming friends with, eating with, fellowshipping with people who started out hating me. I had the capacity to withstand their hatred and the capacity to embrace their friendship. I understood that time defines you. Some people will understand you later. I didn't have the help I needed. I didn't have the money to do what I was doing. I didn't know anybody, but I knew one thing. I'm not in this thing by myself. It's not about perfection, it's about progression. But some of you right now, you've got it in your mind. The only way I can progress is if I get a partner. Oh, but friend, you need something bigger than a partner to pull you out of this season where you feel like you're stuck. Guess what you need? You don't need a partner, you need a God-given purpose. You need something stronger to pull you from the place where you feel like you're stuck. We all go through times well, it doesn't feel like we're making progress. We're being our best, but not getting good breaks. The problem hasn't turned around. When we're not getting our way, we're doing the right thing, but we're being overlooked. Our friend got married, but we're still single. We're working harder than our coworker, but they got the promotion. We feel overlooked, undervalued, forgotten. These times of isolation where you're not being celebrated are extremely valuable. Nothing may be changing on the outside, but something's happening on the inside. Your character is being developed. You're learning to not depend on people. You're gaining experience, maturity, strength that you'll need to go where God is taking you. I think we live in a world that doesn't know the difference between the public moments and the private moments. I think we're increasingly becoming, and this is just my old man rant, so please let me do it right now, because like I said, I'm a parent now, and I'm so scared for my kids who are growing up in a world where now they're growing up publicly. Everybody has their own broadcast journalism degree called Twitter. Everybody has a license to express their own opinion. And the phrase that got me is what his brother said. They want to convince him. They say, you got to get out of Galilee. This is too remote. This is not the right place for you to become a public figure.
I'm telling you, it ain't nothing as dangerous as somebody who's making a comeback. You haven't had a fight till you get in the ring with somebody who's making a comeback. You haven't been through hell till you run up and punch somebody who ain't got nothing to do. Slap somebody and say, nowhere to go but up. Already lost everything. Already been through trouble. Already been embarrassed. Already been humiliated. Already been talked about. Already been laughed at. Already been betrayed. Already had my feelings hurt. Tell somebody, say, nowhere to go but up. You can start to make a new stretch today. You can sign up for some new classes today. You can start engaging in constructive thinking today. You can make some life-changing decisions today. See, you don't ever have to be the same again, only by choice. And while you wait for prices to come down, I would go to work immediately and quickly on the refinement of your own thinking and the refinement of your own disciplines and watch how quickly the equity of that starts to grow. Now this is called dealing in straight talk. Let's go do it. This is what I found out being a professional alone person. It's okay to be alone. I get over a thousand messages every single day. And a lot of people write to me saying, Ralph, I just can't seem to find anybody I can get on with. And I don't like it. It's okay to be alone. The reason why a lot of people experience a lot of loneliness is because they are in resistance to being alone. Because being alone is frightening for the majority of the human race. You gotta be with yourself. You gotta go within. A lot of stuff is gonna come out. That's why a lot of us, we wanna always be with friends. But if you continue just to follow the crowd, you will only go as far as the crowd. Life situations is to use the illustration of the seasons. Number one, you cannot change the seasons until you get your own planet. All of this has been set in motion. But here's the next piece of information. You can change yourself. You can't change the seasons, but you can change yourself. Life and business is like the changing seasons. Frank Sinatra sings, life is like the seasons. First, learn how to survive the winter. Speaking of life in its simplest aspect, the first key to learn in your life on the spinning planet is to learn how to survive. Now there's all kinds of winters, right? The winter of the calendar, right? The winter of this actual season. But then there's financial winters and social winters, personal winters. But we understand those because we've all been through. Now here's the key on the winters. Some are long and some are short. Some are easy and some are tough. But they always come right after harvest, right after fall, autumn. So we cannot rearrange the coming of the winters, but here's what we could do. Get stronger, wiser, and better so that we can survive better. And our life will be less eroded by learning to handle the next winter, the next winter of a divorce, the next winter of an illness, the next winter of a death in the family, the next winter of a loss financially, the next winter of a, a crisis of whatever kind to be better equipped. So here's the key to learn the season so that you can approach it all in a very intelligent way. So you must think negative when it's positive. You must think winter when it's summer. Here's some of the best advice. It comes from classic tradition. A great story says, don't build your house on the sand in the summer. You must not be faked out when it's nice. You must think storm in the summer and not get faked out. And if you think storm, now you'll look for a rock on which to build your house. Now you're gonna be safe. So you can't think nice when it's nice. You gotta think storm when it's nice. The seasons are gonna come and change. And if you're not educated to that degree, now you suffer a great loss. Now here's the next philosophy. The time to think positive is when it's negative. Why? Because the negative won't last long. How long is the winter? Isn't that long? Just hang on, it's not gonna take that long. How long is the night? 
It's only a few hours. There's never been a double night. Couldn't you make it a, a few more hours? And the story says, yes, the, the, the night just can't last. Sometimes it seems like it's going to last forever. And when you have insomnia, right, it seems like the night will never pass. But I'm telling you, sure enough, it will pass. So learn to think day when it's night. And then you must learn to think night when it's day. So you have to get it going, get it in before the night came. So, this is a good idea now. Learn to think negative when it's positive. Learn to think storm when there is no storm. Learn to think winter in the summer. Then we must learn to think summer in the winter. We can make it through a few more hours, right? A few more days. It won't be that long. Hang in here. The spring will surely come. So the winters of life, learn to express those to other people. Help them understand that as well as to try to understand it yourself. Now here's the next season, the spring. Spring is called opportunity, not a guarantee. It's guaranteed the spring will come, but it's not a guarantee of a harvest. Here's the key, you must do something with the spring. Take advantage of the spring. Read every book you can get your hands on what to do with the springs of your life. Take advantage of the day, because the day follows the night. It's an opportunity now to turn things around. It's an opportunity to have a better one than, than the last one. It's an opportunity for a new beginning, a new spring, a new day, a new beginning. So spring is the, is the chance to take advantage of another opportunity. Now, here's what you must do in the spring. It's a very short season usually, you must hurry. You wouldn't ask a farmer to go bowling in the spring. He hasn't got time, why? The season is too short. Planting season is too short. You've got to get it done fairly quickly. Now we call spring a window of opportunity. If you have a chance to talk to someone, the window's open. It may not stay open very long, so take advantage. Don't hesitate. Meet a new friend. Talk to somebody while the window's open. Now here's the season for everybody to understand because it is so applicable to our life, and that's the season of summer. Two things we must do in the summer, nourish our values and protect. Nourish like a mother, protect like a father. The twin challenges in the summertime help to illustrate life, that we are confronted with both good and evil. When you're at the top, when you're an owner or you're the leader, there's times where you have to do things by yourself. There's no doubt about that. And if you have a problem with that, you're going to have a problem being in a leadership position. Because there's things that you have to do as a leader. You have to lead from the front. You have to work harder. You have to do extra. And if you're not, that's not good. And if you're, if you're working harder, there's going to be times when you're not with anyone else. And you have to be okay with that. That's what that expression means, it's lonely at the top, meaning like you're at the top because you're willing to behave or be a certain way that other people either can oh, or yeah, won't, yeah, yeah. right? From that perspective, you're definitely lonely at the top. Yeah. There's no one that's going to sit there and do what I'm willing to do to be there. Like, where are you at? I don't know. Haven't seen you. If you want any value at all, come harvest. You got to press. You got to be bold. The high life is not for the timid and the shy. Some people mistake timidity for humility. Humility is a virtue. Timidity is a disease. Humility is almost godlike word. A sense of awe, a sense of wonder, a sense of understanding the distance in worth, an awareness of the human soul, the spirit, something unique about the human drama versus the rest of life. A grasp of the distance between us and the stars, and yet having the feeling that we're part of the stars. It's okay to dream, but we must not just become a dreamer. Be proud, but not arrogant. It takes pride to win the day. It takes pride in company, opportunity. It takes pride in group, organization. It takes pride in cause and accomplishment. But the key is to be proud without being arrogant. If you want the audacity to be successful, don't you understand the crap that comes along with that? Like, I wanted the audacity to be in shape. It's come with a lot of crap. It's been a lot of work. You deal with it because it's a very small price to pay for all the phenomenal stuff that you headline read and you aspire to and you dream for. The problem is most of you don't want to eat that shit to get there. I 
analyze where you are, go into your store. What's in here? What's old? What's decaying? What stinks? Okay, what's that over there? Negative attitude. We gotta get rid of that one. Negative people. We can't hang anymore. You got to go. You can't do this anymore. Fear. Come out of there. What's over there in the corner? Procrastination. What's over there? Okay, bad attitude. All that stuff. Get out of there. Throw it up. It's got to go. And what do I need? What do I need to get me from where I am to where I need to go? What do I need? Okay, I need more people who dream like me, who think like me, who can stretch and grow like me. I gotta surround myself with more people like that. All right, good. I, I need more confidence here. I need to develop more belief in my ideas and in my in my plans. I've got to do that. What else do I need to get to where I need to get to? To get to survive, to live. What, I, what do I need? Okay, I'm going to a new place. I need new skills. So this is what it is, inventory. Throw out what you don't need and what you need. Here's one of the, the better realistic illustrations, and that's health and illness at odds in your body. Illness trying its best to drive health into a small corner and occupy the territory. And health trying what? To push illness into a small corner. There's this contest going on. Who's gonna occupy the territory? If one stays strong, the other's diminished. If the other gains in power, then the other is diminished. So what you must learn to do is cooperate with the positive side of everything in your body and your life. Sometimes we sabotage our own best interest. Because if we get weak, I'm telling you, it moves in, moves in, moves in, takes the territory. So we're in the middle of this contest, and here's what it's called, opposites in conflict. Good, evil, liberty, tyranny, right? Health, illness, winning and losing, right? There's, a, there's the struggle going on. But here's the key. It's the only way, it seems, it's the only way to create a human adventure. It doesn't seem to be any other way currently. It seems like to create an adventure, to create a unique human scenario, we need opposites in conflict. And it's the only way to have a civilized society. And we've got to fight these skirmishes. We've been fighting them forever. We've got to fight them forever. Whether they're inside your own body or whether they're in politics, no matter where they are, we must play this game. We must fight this game. But here's what it creates, a great adventure. Let me give you the ultimate now. Could you win if you couldn't lose? And the answer is no, it doesn't seem like it. You, you couldn't call it winning. You can't win if you couldn't lose. So that's the deal now negative positive would there be negative uh, positive without negative no it doesn't seem like it it seems like this is the current setup you know for the foreseeable future it looks like it's been that way as long as we can remember and as long as the history tells us so here's what you want to do if you want the adventure you must learn to play this game to work with all the positive forces to defeat the negative forces as early and as soon and as much as possible to contain the ravages of disease that want to take you early you got to fight back. You can't just leave it. Somebody says, well, I got my fingers crossed. Not a good philosophy. You got to take your vitamins. You got to do the stuff. You got to do the deal. Jump on the positive side of whatever you want and see if you can't help out in this warfare and this push shove match. That's the key. So in the summer, here's what you must do. Nourish the plants and the garden. Nourish your values like a mother. Give life. Whatever you start now, you must nourishment and give it life. Don't neglect a new life if you've started a new life. What if you said to a brand new mother, where is your baby? She says, I have no idea. You would say, no, that isn't right. If you start a new life, you must care for it. You must protect it. You must give it life, give it nourishment. Now, here's the other part. You must protect it like a father. That's why the old wise man said, we must learn to love and hate. And the illustration he used was, you must learn to love good and hate evil. To deal with the weeds in your garden, you've got to hate weeds. you got to hate them enough to what? Kill them. You can't say, well, poor weeds. Say, no, this ain't the deal, poor weeds. So, learn the good evil. Now, here's the greatest battle in the mind. Here's what you must not become in the summer in your mind, a victim of yourself. What is that insidious voice inside your own head that says you're too short, it'll never work for you, you're too tall, right? It's over for you, right? It's never worked for you before. What gives you any idea that it'll work for you now? You've never been able to rise up and take charge of your life. What makes you think you can do it now? 
there's going to be too many obstacles out there. You'll never overcome them all. What is that insidious voice? It's the same game going on inside your head that's going on in the world. Liberty and tyranny in a push-shove match. And here's what you've got to do. Cooperate with the positive side of your life and let faith drive out doubt, right? Let winning drive out losing. Let positive drive out negative. But you've got to get into the contest. And why get into the contest? Because that's how you create an adventure. There is no other way. It takes both. You've got to learn to laugh, yes, but that's not what the wise men only said. You can't just learn to laugh and keep on laughing. No, that's silly. It says there's also a time to cry. You've got to learn to both laugh and cry. Then it said you must be so sophisticated as not to laugh when it's time to cry. Then it further says you must learn to laugh with those that laugh and learn to cry with those that cry. That now gives you an understanding of what life is all about. Sadness and joy, the contest, the difference. And yet it creates the adventure. But here's the adventure, to overcome the evil, to put evil in its place. Just like in your mind, you've got to stand guard at the door of your mind and see if you can't suppress, see if you can't do battle with the negative forces. Don't become a victim of yourself. Beware of the thief on the street that's after your purse. But also beware of the thief in your mind that's after your promise. See if you can't engage in this mental contest and win the day. That's the summer. Now here's one more season. And that's the season of harvest. Here's the key to remember harvest time. In due season, in due time when it's time. And part of this is to develop the patience so that when it's time, it will come. But you cannot be impatient. Patience is part of the game here. You can't plant the seed and two, three days later, dig around and say, where's my crop, where's my crop? You say, no, come on, that's foolish. We'll take you away to some safe place. This... You've got to plant and wait and exercise patience. And then when it comes time, you give it nourishment and you give it care and you give it protection. And then you got to wait some more and you got to wait some more and you got to wait some more. Hi, welcome back to Mind Control where we inspire and motivate you. Hope you enjoy the video. Now, Shof also said, when you find out something that works, put the information in your journal. Don't use your head for a filing cabinet. Put it in your journal so that you can do the next best thing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Go over it. And if you repeat it, go over it, sure enough, someday, some mysterious day, the idea takes root, starts to grow, and shows up in your bank account, and your dress, and your personality, and your lifestyle. But capture the ideas in your journal. Find out how things work. Shof gave me this word for my life change. He said, study. Great word. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Don't leave it to chance. Make it a study. Some people just go through the day with their fingers crossed. See, that won't do it. You've got to study the things that can change your economic, social, spiritual, personal life. Now, here's a qualifying phrase. And we'll have several of these qualifying phrases throughout the seminar. Here's the first one. You may not be able to do all you find out. I understand that. You may not be able to do all you find out, but you should find out all you can do. See, you don't want to wind up at the end of your life and discover that you've lived only one-tenth of it. And the other nine-tenths went down the drain. Not for lack of opportunity, for lack of information. So that's number one, find out how things work. Now here's the best human virtue for finding out, curiosity. Make a note of that, curiosity, be curious. You might add a word to it that'll help, childish curiosity. What will kids do if they wanna know something bad enough? 
bug you. That's the phrase. They can ask a thousand questions. You think they're through? They got another thousand. They'll drive you to the brink. It's a virtue. When you gotta know, be like a child. In fact, Jesus, the master teacher said, unless you can become like little children, you might as well forget it. You don't have a prayer. Excellent advice. You gotta be like children. Four ways, in my opinion, to be like a child. Number one's curiosity. Number two is excitement. Get excited like a child over your ability to make yourself do anything for change. Third is faith. Have faith like a child. Adults are too skeptical. And fourth is trust. Trust is a childish virtue, but the rewards are incredible. Now here's the second step to personal development. Okay, number one was find out how things work. Here's number two, go to work. You must now take action on what you found out. In doing business around the world, we call it game plan. Put together your game plan. One of the major things we teach on the weekend seminars, game plans. How to game plan your office. If you're in sales, you need a game plan. Kids need a game plan. You need a home game plan, social game plan, a business game plan. Everybody needs game plans. Financial independence, game plan. Your investment, game plan. Don't think in your head, put it on paper. Don't operate out of your mind. Operate from paper. I often ask somebody, what are you gonna do the next six months? And somebody starts to tell me. I say, no, don't tell me, show me. Show me your game plan for the next six months. Then I can look at things and maybe I can help. But you got to operate from paper. Put it on a game plan, take action on what you found out. Now here's the best word I know of to go with action. Massive. See, that'll change everything. Massive action is called the cure-all. If you're gonna make calls, make a few thousand. If you're gonna make contacts, make a few thousand. If you're gonna knock on doors, knock on a few thousand. See, that'll change everything. Here's the language of the poor. I'll try it a time or two and see what happens. It's the way poor people talk. The guy says, well, I'll give it 30 days. 30 days, you could guess his bank balance. You've got to have a better game plan. So here's one of the major things to do starting tomorrow. Take a look at your game plan. If it isn't loaded with massive action, change it tomorrow. Action. The formula really works like this. Pick up a good idea, take heavy action. Pick up a couple of good ideas, take heavy action. That's the formula for sex, success. Heavy action. It's a good thing we can edit all this, right? The formula for success, take heavy action on a good idea, right? That's the ratio. Now here's the key. Don't wait till you've learned two or 3,000 things because that way you'll use up all the time and you could wind up smart and broke. And hey, it's okay to be dumb and broke. But if a guy's smart and broke, that's pitiful. Don't let your learning lead to knowledge. You'll become a fool. Let your learning lead to action. You can become wealthy. And there's many kinds of wealth. I understand that, not just money. Money's one of the least of all values. I know some people with a lot of money that are very poor. Evita sings, as for fortune and as for fame, they are illusions. They're not the solutions they promised to be. So there's all kinds of wealth, but to get a big share coming your way, you've got to have a heavy action game plan. Now here's the third step to personal development, and we'll wrap up personal development. Step number three, it's just a little caution and all through life we need little cautions. This one simply says, don't try to beat the system. Find out how it works, work it, but don't try to beat it. Some people learn just enough to start slicing it, shading it, thinning it, cutting corners, 
and looking for cheap answers. See, don't fall for that. You'll wind up with a cheap life. Find out how it works best and do it that way. Even though it seems to take a little longer, do it right. Don't compromise with right. Now under this step, here's another key. Be a quick learner. Don't let it take long to teach you. Learn quicker. One guy said he broke his nose seven times in the same place. Somebody says, looks like you'd stay out of that place. <laughs> Learn quicker. Now the third point here is don't be stubborn. See, some people won't change even when a better way comes. They say, well, I've been doing it this way 30 years. Hey, be ready for change. If it's a better way, go for it. But don't try to beat it. We'd like to thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again.